how do I know if a woman is, uh, if a woman likes me? And here's the secret. You always assume she likes you until she proves you otherwise. And she looks over at me and I, I will never forget this. She goes, yeah, uh, you know, I really just see you like one of my good girlfriends. Oh! Once you realize that your internal reality is more real than your external reality, you then have the power to change your external reality. Welcome to the Manceptional Podcast. This is your host, Ken Arcega. Today, we are going to speak with Spencer Burnett, a very interesting gentleman. He's been big in the uh, dating scene, lifestyle, coaching, uh, previously in the, in the uh, pickup artist scene when he started, but has seemed to have progressed um, to a much higher level since then. So I um, really look forward to hearing about his journey, how he started, and how he's gotten to where he is today. Uh, he has some, some interesting titles. Um, his Invisible Academy, he's the alchemist healer. Um, of course, as we mentioned, he's a top tier dating coach uh, or social dynamics expert. Uh, he's got a uh, group called the League of Badass Gentlemen, where he's the commissioner, which is pretty pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, you are consulting, as I understand, at a cannabis consulting firm, which is uh, pretty appropriate these days, or at least yeah. I, I see it a lot here in, in California. Um, and basically, you've been studying studying female psychology, should I say? Uh, yeah. as it relates to dating and relationships for probably over 20 years, right? You said when you were 15 or so? Yeah. Okay, yep. great. Well, Spencer, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Ken, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Yeah, this is great. So I, I've got a question for you. Um, knowing what you know now, okay, okay, have you still screwed up recently and gotten yourself inadvertently into the friend zone? You know, you kind of have you ever gotten your eye off the ball still, even though you know how to do it, but have you ever just messed up a little bit? And you're like, Oh God, <laughs> has that happened to you? Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that's like asking <laughs> Steph Curry, if he's missed a three pointer, you know what I okay, mean? Like enough. it's uh, it, you know, there's, there's always, there's always missteps because you know, every person is, is unique. Right. But the, the, the gift is not in the ability to always hit your mark. It's the ability to always course correct. So you eventually yeah. hit your mark. And right. so have I made the mistakes of getting into the friend zone or, uh, or you know, maybe pushing a little bit too far to where a girl thinks I'm a player? Absolutely. But am I always still in it? Yes, I'm always still in it. So. Yeah, and I think, I think that's what people like to hear because, I mean, who hasn't screwed up? Um, you know, right. I was actually a lot of it, I was looking through and researching all this dating stuff and I was, made me look back at myself <laughs> and some of my past. And um, I had pretty good runs like in, in college. And after that, I was in a band and, you know, I had my, the band, the band helps. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, you know, so I had my thing going and, you know, when you're focused on something else, all the women come, as you know, right. Meet some girl you really like, and it's just, you know, Oh, that you want to be nice because you don't want to treat her like right. you treat the other girls, you know, because this right, girl's right. special. And then you do that, and then you're in the freaking friend zone, like you know. Yeah. But you're not. You're like you think you're a player, and then you and then you just put yourself right in that subservient mental position. Yeah. And you just blew it. Right. And you know, can you you seem you seem like a, a genuinely like nice guy. And, you know, every guy has a tendency, you know, the, uh, between the spectrum of being, you know, a nice guy and a bad boy, we all have the, a, a tendency where we lean or where we feel we're our strongest. Right. And I always tell guys like lead with your left hand, meaning lead with your weak side. Mm -hmm. So if you're naturally a, uh, you know, a, a guy who's really nice and caring, and empathetic, and you really, you know, embody those type of attributes, always lead with your edge. Because it, it's, it's easier to apologize for being too edgy than it is to get out of the friend zone without showing her any of your masculinity at all. So if you got to choose between one. That's a, that's a great piece of advice right off the bat, man. Because, you know, yeah. uh, I, I, I'll guarantee you, you would know better than I would, but I, I guarantee you there's a lot of men that feel like they never showed their true selves to the, the, the girl doesn't know who they really are. Like. Right. You really are a man. You really are interesting. You really do have confidence. You're really on top of your game, but you just put yourself in the wrong slot up front 
and yeah. you thought you could nice your way out of it. And then it's like, then you're just basically a wimp tart, you know, a masculine, right? right? <laughs> yeah. And, and, and you know what the reason, the reason for that is because the, the way that we're processing our interaction with a woman is we, you know, we, we say something and we're looking for feedback. Does she like us? Does she like us? Does she like us? And if the answer is yes, then we, then we give, we show more of our personality. Right. And then over time, you know, she gets to know you and then she gets, starts to see those sides that are a little bit more edgy, you know, ones that, that might be judged a, a little bit further as you start demonstrating your sexuality and like your boldness. Right. But, you know, I, I tell guys this and, uh, and, uh, I'm going to, well, I will, uh, I'll, I'll give you my asterisks at the end of this, okay. you know, they, they always want to know, like, how do I know if a woman is, uh, if a woman likes me and here's the secret, okay. you always assume she likes you until she proves you otherwise. So Ooh. always behave in a way as if you're accepted until she's like, no, no, that that's, you know, she shuts you down somehow. Now, the little asterisk there is this does not mean just kind of plow through women and, and be an asshole or be, you know, aggressive. No, you need to be tastefully and respectfully assertive, but don't, don't hide who you are until she demonstrates that she likes you. Assume she likes you until she tells you otherwise. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, yeah, because that way you can also be yourself more right. without worrying too much about it. And then, yeah. Wow, hey. Yeah. Here you go, uh, everyone listening. You got like some hot tips right there. <laughs> yeah, right off the bat. Right, off, right the off the bat, man. We haven't even gotten into uh, into any details yet. That's awesome. <laughs> so um, let me ask you this: so, uh, you, what, your your aha moment when you first started thinking, "Hey, you know, I like this girl. Um, I'm going to be everything I think that she." Once, when she likes me, and I think you were saying she was a this, this girl was eleven when you met her, <laughs> something yeah. like that. Right? right. Well, keep in mind I was Don't, eleven too. So <laughs> no, I, yeah, 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 yeah. This is not last year. He's not dating. Okay, for the record. Yeah, it's being clear. Eleven year olds. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, so that clarified, um, you know, what you thought at, at age eleven might be what people guys think now. How did you um, have some clarity like wait a minute i did everything i was supposed to do and she doesn't like me so maybe i'm missing something is that what happened to you at that age uh no it wasn't at 11 that that happened so i started this kind of love affair with this girl when i was 11 okay she was okay. like she was my second girlfriend uh ever right and um as i i started dating a, a different girl in high school when i was 15 and uh i ended up getting married to uh, a, a different girl okay so i was oh, married wow. at a young age Wow. And me and this other girl had this back and forth and she wanted me to, to break up with my, my girlfriend. And, and as I was about to get married, she was like, don't do it. Right. Oh. But I did it anyways. And two years went by my marriage. It was not a good idea. We were two very different people. So then uh, me and my, my wife split up about six months later, this girl comes back into my life. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we, we start dating. Now at this point I was running a, a, a fitness company, my own fitness company. Now I was making a quarter million dollars a year. I was driving a fancy car. I had been doing some fitness modeling. I had, Ooh. you know, I was well, it sounds, at the sounds awesome. I mean, oh, <laughs> I, I was a two time author, you know, I was teaching yeah. at the national personal training Institute. I, I literally thought I had everything that a woman is looking for. I had, I had a good job. You know, I, I had a lot of money. I drove a nice car. I was in great shape. And uh, me and this girl were, you know, we'd go on dates. I took her to get massages. Uh, we were planning a trip to Mexico and we were on, we went to an amusement park for, uh, for I, what I thought was a date. And I professed my love to her. And I was oh. like, Hey, a lot of time together. I, uh, I really, uh, really starting to you know, like you. And she looks over at me and I, I will never forget this. She goes, yeah, uh, you know, I really just see you like one of my good girlfriends. Oh, and I oh. was like, devastating. I, you know, I'm like, we've been playing this game of cat and mouse. You told me not to get married. I'm like, I literally had everything. Like, what else could you possibly want? And then she ends up dating some club douche that, you know, that, that picked her up a month later. And I'm thinking to myself, what is it? There, there has to be something that I'm missing. My yeah. family knew her family. We went way back. We had history. You know, we, 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 at one point we, you know, were both physically attracted to each other. What was it? And it was at that point that I decided like, I'm going to figure this out because, um, 
uh, this should be working for me. And so I spent the next, uh, the next like year and a half interviewing a bunch of women trying to figure out what it is that they want. And it turns out that women know what they want, but they don't know how to guide men to give it to them. You know, mm-hmm. it's yeah. like, you know, you can know what kind of car you want, but you don't know how to fix an engine, you know? Right. So, yeah. Uh, and so then I started, uh, I started working with some guys that, uh, that, that weren't very good looking or rich or anything like that, but they were, they were getting women. And so, uh, I started kind of hanging out with them and, and picking their brains and, you know, going out with those guys. And I was like, okay, I, I see what's missing now. And that's what started my whole, uh, my whole dating career. So you say that women know what they want, but they just don't know how to direct a, a man or find a man that gives it to them in that particular sequence or angle or whatever. Um, now I know this is a huge question. And what do women want? I mean, that's like the $64,000 question. Everyone wants to know, yeah. is there, is there, um, anything, uh, is this, does this get into qualities of a man or does this get, what does this get into when you're saying what women want or is it actual well, like, uh, techniques or, tactics like you know you're you're a little bit aloof at first so they have to chase you which is kind of built in the croc brain everyone sure. wants to chase something they can't have you know what is it right <laughs> right well well here here's the thing and the conversations i have with guys they're like okay so let me get this straight so they want a bad boy that they can take home to mom okay they want me to be assertive but they also want me to be patient right they want me to they want me to t- take charge and, and and um you know and be a leader but they also want me to be empathetic and, you know, and to kind of take a back seat and, and let them. So it's like, so what is it that women want? It seems like they want this, the complete opposite attributes at the same the time. time. <laughs> right. And okay. there's your answer. Women simultaneously want the opposite things all the time. And That's so it. That's now literally the, it. It, that is, that is it. So then it is like, well, then how, how do you give that to them? And that, and that's what I teach in my, you know, in my Omega Man course that I, you know, that I do with guys that have pretty much everything else. They figured everything else out in their life except for this one thing. And uh, you know, I basically show them how to be everything to women. Well, so since you mentioned that, let's talk about it. Um, I I saw that uh, you're positioning Omega Man as as beyond the alpha male, right? The alpha yeah, male is right. an obvious archetype. You're confident. You're, you know, all this stuff, right? You're the leader. Right. Men, men want to be you. Women want to be with you. You know, the right. usual stuff. you're the best. Um, yeah, you're, you're number the best. one. Yeah, which is, I think, what most men would strive to be in their own way. But how does Omega Man go beyond that? You know, what are you adding well, in or taking away from from the alpha male? Which is right. Well, see now, the, and that's the biggest myth that the whole dating industry has been feeding guys for the past twenty years is that women want alpha males. When women prefer alpha males to weaker men, for sure. Mm-hmm. But women aren't looking for the best, the best looking, the best abs, the most money, the most prestigious jobs. Okay, because there's always some dude that's got better abs than you, more money than you, sure. better, cooler job than you, right? So if women aren't looking for the best, what are they looking for? Women are looking for the exception. Women are looking for rarity, uniqueness, okay? And if you understand who you are as a man and how to demonstrate that in a confident and charismatic way, you can be something to a woman of which no other woman has ever experienced before. And, and, that, and that's what they want, rarity. Okay. It's, what, it's not what does about, that mean though? What is that? What does exception and rarity mean? What does that mean? So, so let me, let me give you, um, let me give you, uh, you know, an example. Okay. Of, of how, well, uh, here's, here's what I mean by rarity. Uh, talking to a woman in a way that she's not used to being talked to. Okay. And, and again, this doesn't mean, you know, nagging her as it's said in, in the industry or giving her back, you know, backhanded compliments, but it's, but it's genuinely, it's, it's genuinely asking, uh, you know, maybe asking her a question that she'd never been asked before. You know, when, when a guy walks up to a girl and he's like, Hey, look, Hey, look, I, um, I saw you from across the way and I, um, you look beautiful and I wanted to come here and see what you're all about. And she's like, you know, well, what do you, what do you mean? You know? And most guys might be like, hey, uh, you know, where, where, where are you from? What do you do for a living? Those are all basic questions. Yeah, but it's like, you know, I, I, I want to know what your favorite color is, you know, whether you're afraid of spiders or not. You know, I want to I want to know, like, 
you know, I want I want to know what your favorite TV show is and, and, and binge with you. Like those are things like, okay, that's a fresh approach that most men, you know, really wouldn't say. And, um, and so that, that's a, a small example. I'm just like talking to a woman, but also like something, something rare, like who are you as a person? What, what do you believe in? What are you passionate about? Where are your gifts? How do you amplify those gifts? And how do you manage your weaknesses? Like, who are you when no one's looking? Like, the, like all of these, these things that are intricate, that, that make uh, each person unique. Uh, if you can demonstrate those way, it, those in a way that's captivating to women, she can be like, huh, this guy, this guy's different than, than every other guy out there. And, um, and that's what starts to, you know, that's what we help guys find to help them start setting themselves apart. So, so you, obviously you would have to work with people individually because there's not a blanket thing, I would suppose. I mean, what if somebody doesn't have any confidence or they don't think they're very interesting? How do you find something that is interesting or unique about that person? Or what if there isn't, you can't really find anything that's unique? How would they, mm. or, or is there always something unique about people? That's it. There is always something unique about people. So for instance, like, uh, you know, when, when I, when I ask someone like, you know, what, what did you do today? That was interesting. And they're like, oh, oh, nothing. Uh, you don't necessarily have to make your life more interesting. You have to just find more interest in your own life. So mm -hmm. I could, I can, I can do something, you know, super you know, fun and exciting. There's a thing that I go to called Daybreaker. It is, it's a, it's a, um, it's a non-alcoholic dance party that's held at six in the morning. So it's basically <laughs> just a bunch of like spirit hippies, that are, you know, drinking kombucha and getting a good start on the day, but they've got a DJ, they got a live band. It's super fun. And that's a unique concept, right? That's kind of cool. Oh, it, dude, it's, it's the best. And I think they might have, have it in LA. So. You know, I would think I, you know, I haven't heard of that. I would think they would have it here, but actually yeah. that's kind of a cool idea. Like if no one else is doing it to kind of try something like that, just to kind of, I don't know, network and meet people. Yeah. Start something. That's okay. yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. So, so if, uh, if you take a look at my Instagram, right. And my Instagram stories, you might see me at something super cool like that. And I'm, and I'm shooting it, whatever. Now, on the other hand, I don't do that every day. Some days I just make myself some avocado toast in the morning. But if you, if there's a way that you, that I can take a, you know, a Snapchat or, uh, or a story and make that interesting, fun, creative, that, that demonstrates that no matter what's going on in my life, where I, uh, I create my own excitement, I create my own, my own interest. So whether you're at a, at a crazy party with me or whether we're just having breakfast together, it's going to be interesting because I find interest in, and value in the small things. Do you, you know what you just made me think of? Uh, I don't know if you remember the movie Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Do you remember that movie? It. Oh, I haven't okay. seen it. You got to see it. And, and I'm going to name this one little scene. So when you do see the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's a scene where this guy, he's kind of an older guy, and he's trying to coach this young guy who's kind of nerdy, like how to be cool, how to get chicks to like him. Yeah. And they go to the mall, the Sherman Oaks Galleria, and he stands there and he looks around the Galleria. He's like, isn't this the coolest place to be? Something like something to that effect. Right. It's just like wherever you are, this is the best place to be in the world. And it's kind of yes. similar to what you're talking about. You create your own, Absolutely. you know, where you are is where things are exciting, where things are happening. Kind of that gist. Exactly. You, yes. see Absolutely. you, you have to see that movie. It's a classic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm writing it down. That'll, yeah. that is, I'll definitely put that on the list. Cool. So, okay. So what we're talking about. Uh, so, so being, being interesting to women. Yes. Okay? okay. So, uh, so also like a lot of guys, a, a lot of guys don't find themselves, don't find themselves interesting, but there's a way to have conversations with women to, um, there's ways to have conversations with women to, to be interesting. Like how do you have a conversation with her so that it's pulling out like the, you know, the, the fun, you know, aspect of her personality or the interesting aspect of, of her personality. At that point, you don't have to be interesting because if you're talking to someone about their favorite subject matter, then they're going to enjoy talking to you. And, you know, there's a number of ways you can figure out like what they're really passionate about, but there's one topic of conversation that is everybody's favorite, which is themselves. And so, you know, if you, you learn how to, you know, have conversations with them about themselves that makes them want to, you know, continue to engage, you know, you're, you're in right there. Yeah. So I, I kind of learned that and I've been in, in uh, 
sales, kind of enterprise sales for the, the past, uh, I recently out of it, but I was in it for a long time. That's one thing you find is what that person likes. And whenever you get a, an executive talking about themselves mm-hmm. and they're having fun, that's, you know, you, you've just kind of opened them up a little bit. And then, oh, right. okay. now, now listen to what you have to say after I got my jollies out. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, but let me ask you this, because I read something that I don't remember where it was that you don't want to ask the girl about herself because then you're making her do the work. Kind of does that sound sound familiar to you? I don't know. I haven't been in this industry, so I don't know. So is that a yeah. little bit opposite of what you're saying, or like what's the? Well, you want to make it easy for her to talk about herself. So, for instance, I have a student that um, that was was texting a girl. He, I, I guess, he met her on Tinder or something, and he's like, "So, tell me about yourself. What are you all about?" Well, oh, that's too that, general. That is so so general. Now this girl has to deal with her own social anxiety of feeling like boring or being put on the spot or, uh, or all of that. So, um, you want to make it really easy for you to, in, you know, engage, you know, so you can ask a specific question, uh, such as, you know, so what do you do for a living now? That's a little bit more specific that she can answer right now. Right. You can engage with that a little bit more by just making a fun, you know, a fun assumptions, you know, the, what do you do for a living? You look really conservative. So I'm guessing you're some type of school teacher or librarian and whether that's true or not. And you're also, you're also giving her a little like flirty jab a little bit. Right. Just, right. Yeah. Okay. yeah got exactly. It. And, and, and now, and now that becomes, now that that becomes fun. And it's like, uh, you know, and, you know, she might say, uh, no, I'm an executive assistant at, at a law firm and be like, that's awesome. I could use one of those. Like, what are they paying you? I'll double it. You know, and, and now you get, you know, now you can, uh, and, and she laughs, she smiles, whatever. And, and then you can ask, you know, a specific question. So most guys will ask, will ask, you know, well, you know, what do you do? I asked her like, no, really, what do you do? Like when you walk in, what's your first responsibility? And I kind of t- and she goes through her day, and then that whole part of like finding interest in the little things, mm-hmm. then you can start commenting on that. So even if her if the first thing she does is you know check the water cooler to see if there's a bottle in there, like um, you know you can say okay, so you're a certified you know water boy. So I mean you could probably get a job you know at a at a mm-hmm. university you know uh, so mm-hmm. you definitely put that on your resume. And then you go into the, the next question. So uh, again, it's, uh, you know, a lot of times we get into just interview mode where we just question after question after question. Whereas if you want to have more, um, uh, more exciting conversation, more engaging conversation, you want to ask the question about her, take whatever she says to you, play with it a little bit, and then ask another question. That way you can still ask the same questions. What do you do? Where did you grow up? Where are you, you know, uh, where are you from? What are your dreams? And it doesn't, it doesn't sound like you're sitting across, you know, a table trying to, you know, pull information out of her. Plus you also sound like you're listening, right? Because you're reacting to what she's saying. You're not, you know, she talks and then you boom, go on to the next question that, you know, right. you don't react at all to what she's saying. So basically you're not listening. You're just going down a list. Exactly. Exactly. Now, does this get, um, you mentioned somewhere that you had studied like NLP, which is neuro linguistic programming. And I don't know too much about it other than a, you're using words or ways to communicate to, sure. to make suggestions, yeah. whatever. Is some of what you're talking about here, does, is that involved in this or? Um, yeah. So NL, NLP is, um, it, it's kind of in the, the same kind of genre as uh, psychology. Psychology more so studies kind of like, um, you know, symptoms and what's wrong and like how the, how the brain naturally functions. Whereas NLP studies, uh, it, it's the study of excellence. And so it, and so how do we, how do we pattern uh, excellence so we can achieve the things that we want to essentially NLP is uh, computer programming for the human mind. So if you want to be able to wire your mind to be able to do anything, uh, NLP is the science behind that. So behind everything that Tony Robbins does, Tony Robbins mm-hmm. worked under um, um, the two founders of NLP, and that is that's what he that's his primary tool that he uses to do all of his work. Um, he just packages it very well in, in a non clinical way. I learned NLP uh, when I was eight years old, and mm. I was I was taken to uh, I was taken to this psychologist that was doing this uh, that was doing this kind of 
uh, this kind of test research on pain management. When I was younger, all the way until I was 30, I had an autoimmune disease that essentially caused me to get high grade fevers, um, like upwards to 106 degrees. Uh, every four to six weeks, uh, every every four to six weeks for the first thirty years of my life. Oh my and god! And so I, I've a you know we're talking you don't eat sleep uh, shit. Oh, I don't know if I could say that on, on your on your yeah, channel, but I, I can put a little explicit that you can say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, right. yeah. I mean, you uh, for an entire week, I'd lose eighteen pounds in a week. Sometimes I'd be hospitalized. I mean, my heart stops working one time. Jeez. I essentially have been tortured two hundred times in my life, and I had been to every type of doctor. I mean, um, prescribed. I mean, a, a pint of liquid Vicodin at, at a time. And when I was eight years old, I went to this, this doctor to work on um, visualization techniques to manage pain because I, I physically could not take any more pain medication. And what I learned there is, and, and this truly is the secret to creating anything you want in your life. So for your listeners that are listening, this is the gem right here. Okay. Once you realize that your internal reality is more real than your external reality, you then have the power to change your external reality. That's pretty freaking cool. And you, you so, realize at eight years old? Eight years old. Wow. Uh, hen hence, um, you know, I've been a coach since I was, you know, 15. Uh, I started in the fitness industry and I, I've worked in sales. I've worked in you know, business consulting. Uh, I've worked in, in social coaching and now in the dating industry. Uh, and, and all of that is a derivative of learning these super valuable lessons through some pretty serious physical and emotional and spiritual hardships uh, growing up. And, and that's where, that's where my gift comes from. I, I didn't go to college. Uh, I'm not, I'm not certified at, I'm not certified by any governing bodies. Um, I just have a, a, a gift to helping people shift their, or identify and shift their behaviors so they can get what they want out of life. That's, that's pretty amazing. And you, you kind of had an idea about this early on, right? Maybe now you're, you've been fulfilling it all along in various guises, but uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the one thing you mentioned was that you, you have, I, I asked you, what's a superpower of yours? And you said the ability to use language to create and heal or, or talent was a powerful language healing modality that's going to yeah. change the world. Is that, yes, is this sir. what we're talking about? Yes, sir. It is. It's called precise wow. language. Precise language. And, Did you, is that your not, thing? Did you make it up? Precise yes. language? Yeah. I, I developed it through, um, through uh, the past 20 years of, um, I guess the spiritual people would call it channeling. Uh, you know, more human people would just call it journaling and, you know, introspective thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty severely dyslexic. So I actually have a hard time uh, being uh, indoctrinated and learning from external sources, which is why I, I learn a lot through, um, you know, personal journaling and through mentorship. Uh, because that's uh, relationships in, in language is really how I, how I, you know, or spoken language is how I connect. Um, but yeah, precise language came came about about five or six years ago, and the uh, the basic concept of it is the way that the brain functions in order to achieve anything that it wants is it starts with a desire, a feeling of of dissatisfaction. And there's like so, so for instance, let's make it real simple. Let's say, hey, I'm thirsty. Okay, there's dissatisfaction right in my head, and then I I have this idea in my head. There's a beer in the fridge. Okay, so then my brain creates this image of a beer in the fridge, right? And then from that image, I, m your brain gives you a directive: Hey, stand up, go into the fridge, and go grab go grab that beer. And then once you once I do that, I crack open the beer, and then I drink it, and I'm no longer that that that, uh, that dissatisfaction has gone away, and I've completed the creation cycle. Well. In order for you to be able to achieve anything, whether it's simply to get a beer out of the fridge or it's to lose 100 pounds or it's to become a millionaire or it's to get that girl or, it, or it's to, to heal yourself from some type of, of emotional trauma, it doesn't matter. It starts with that dissatisfaction. I want to be thinner. I want that girl. I, you know, I, I want to be happy. And then it comes to this vision. And this is a lot of times where, uh, where we get stuck in, in this kind of in this loop. 
because we we often when we want something we only talk about what we don't want. And mm. so I, I want you to I want you to imagine this. If I'm telling you if if I was like um, if if I was like hey you know what I want you to uh, I want you to get my I want you to get my keys from my house Ken. And, uh, and so you're like, all right, Spence, I'm at your house. Where are they? And I'm like, okay, they're not in the kitchen. They're not in the living room. They're not in the bathroom. They're not in the hallway. And they're like, okay, well, this must be in your bedroom. You go in my bedroom. You're like, okay, I'm in there. Where are they at? I'm like, it's not under my bed. It's not under my pillow. It's not under uh, the nightstand. It's not in my closet. At some point you just be like, yo, Spence, I'm just going to ransack your room and look for it, man. And you're, you're not really saying anything. And I'm like, oh, I've been talking for like five minutes, but if you were to close your eyes and, and try to achieve what you're trying to achieve, which is get my keys without the image, you're lost. Mm. And so, and so in, in this example, me telling you where my keys are, it is represents the voice in your head that, that tells you how to get what you want. But if all you're talking about is what you don't want then it's impossible to have that image. But now imagine, and because here's the thing, when you talk about what you don't want, what you're saying is, uh, um, let me give you a better example. If I tell you, you know, can I got something in my hand? It's not a bottle cap. Well, essentially what I'm saying, it could be infinity minus <laughs> a bottle cap, right? right. I'm not really right. saying anything. But now imagine that I, I removed all of the knots and I only spoke of what was. Okay, Ken, I want you to go into my house go down the hallway in, into my bedroom. You're going to see a giant windowsill. And on the right-hand side, there's a silver square jar. And in there is a bunch of change. Go underneath that change. My keys are there. And there's an orange keychain. Now, if you were to close your eyes and say, okay, I, I want to, I have this dissatisfaction. I need to find Spencer's keys. And I want to get two keys in my hand. Now that you have a clear image, how much faster yeah, are you? You can right go right to it. So we do this so much when, uh, and there's a lot other words other than not that are voids. So for instance, if, if you're like, um, you know, I, I just don't want to, I, I just, I want to stop being disappointed in my life. Well, disappointed, like you're proud of something. So what do you want to be proud of? Okay. Now, now we can actually go somewhere. You see, see what I'm what saying? Yeah. So this is um, what's what's crazy about this, Ken. And, and, and me and you should do a precise language session sometime. Maybe even yeah, your that sounds really interesting. Yeah. But when, once you get the rules, it takes me about thirty minutes to kind of like explain. Uh, you know, I give I give this meta view of how the universe works and how the human experience works, um, and then I explain precise language, and everyone says the same thing. Okay, that that makes sense. Sounds pretty easy. But once you once you start talking, what's interesting is. There are emotional, there are emotions, negative emotions, or as I call them, monsters in your head, right? You can call them demons or whatever you want, but there are monsters in your head that keep you stuck because they want you to be, feel negative. And, and it's interesting. You can, you can identify exactly where those monsters are by the way that you're using your language. And it's mm -hmm. unbelievable, Ken, the, the, the type of things that I have, uh, that I've seen be healed through using this language modality. Like I what? Mean, everything. Like example. Depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, uh, hemorrhoids. I'm not joking, bro. <laughs> oh come on! Are you serious? Not not joking. I'm also I'm also going to tell you that for 30 years I was tortured over 200 times, and once I sorted out in my head using precise language, I never got sick again. Wow. So I'm not That's making any medical wow. claims here, but I'm also yeah. saying. Uh, you have to either believe that it's a coincidence or that it works. Well, so. you know, uh, this is fascinating. And, and I just had a thought while you were talking, what you need to do is you need to do a Ted talk, man. Yeah. And get in front of 15 million people yeah. about this precise language, because that could blow up huge. I mean, if you want to change the world, that's one way to get some initial visibility that will just, put you on a whole other plane you know uh, i yeah. mean plenty of examples of that happening you just, i don't know have you looked into that how do you get on that thing you know i haven't looked into it I, you know that's something that i got to talk to some of my uh you know some of my mentors about that helped me you know market myself and and uh help you know help me stay focused on you know getting my message out there you know yeah because that's that's amazing and it makes me um i just interviewed a doctor who's into naturopathic um uh, medicine and he does stuff with gut biome and all that but but basically he was saying the 
uh, which you know makes sense when I say it. It sounds so simple. Obviously, your 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 brain and body are connected. So what you think in your mind affects your body. So so the illnesses that you're talking about, it absolutely makes sense. I think most people would agree, at least on the surface, that yeah, there's a connection there. Um, but you know, our society and the way medicine and mental health and all that stuff hasn't gotten to the point where they'll rely on that and said they want to just give uh, pills, you know. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And uh, all disease, all disease starts with emotion and, and even genetic diseases that are passed down from generation to generation, those mutations happen, those, those, um, you know, those genetic mutations happen, you know, over the course of time through there being some, through there being some type of, uh, original emotion that, that didn't go right. Um, it, that, that's kind of a longer conversation to have because I think a, a few people would contest that. But if we have enough time to have that conversation, I can absolutely uh, prove it. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, maybe we'll do that on a separate, separate uh, podcast or something. It's yeah. very interesting. Well, so let me ask you this: um, one thing I noticed that I thought was very interesting is that you've had different. Um, it's not an alias. I, I'll correct myself on that. Different stages in your life where you. Uh, chose a, a different name that kind of represents your your stage that you're in okay sure. yeah and um it's been through various guises so spencer burnett as i understand was kind of the alpha male type thing um are you going to stick with that moving from you know make a man's move forward but what you're talking about now is just you know it's right. way way up here it's it's way above and beyond uh, the dating game. It's, it's like right. a humanity type thing. So um, any thoughts on another side of yourself as represented by your name? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I, uh, I, I, I uh, it's, it's good that you did your, your research on, the, on this. <laughs> it's good. So yeah, I had a difference, you know, my, my birth name is Kevin Chimura. Right. And, you know, I, you know, all throughout my, you know, when I was in eighth grade, they called me uh, Murrah's because my last name is Chimura and they would call me uncle Murrah's because they would, all my friends would sit at my feet while I gave them advice about girls. And so, so that was kind of like my first. And is, that what age, is that what age now? This was, I, this was at like 12, 13. I so, love it. I love yeah, it. I mean, I, yeah, I've, I've always been this guy. Um, yeah. You know, as as time time went on, I kind of had more of a, a player version of me that was Trent Steele. Like, you know how everyone has the drunken version of them, you know, right. like their That's alter ego. That, yeah. that was Trent Steele. He don't come around much anymore. Uh, but it, it's interesting that, you know, Spencer Burnett uh, came about because I was trying to come up with the name of my company that was kind of, uh, you didn't really know what I was doing. Because originally I started being a dating coach because I was teaching guys how to give oral sex to their girlfriends. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want my mom knowing I was teaching guys how to eat pussy for a living. So, um, she knows, she knows now. Yeah. yeah I was going to say, did she ever figure that out at some point? Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I had to come clean at some point, you know? Yeah. Um, but what, what's interesting is, uh, for a while I, um, I didn't like ask to be called Spencer when I wrote, wrote blog posts and stuff like that. I went by that. It's only once I started like actually doing healing work that I, uh, that I started going by Spencer full time. So I really feel like that the Spencer Burnett is, is actually the, you know, the transcendent healer version of me that it, that's meant to put, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, have a serious effect on right on raising the vibration of the entire planet. Um, the, the playboy version of me, we call Spencey B. That's, that's Spence the, B. Spence right, okay. B. Spence yeah. B is a little bit more of the, you know, so of the dickling and playboy that's, you know, having triad relationships and pulling foursomes on Halloween. Yeah. So let me, okay. So there's a couple things here. So I guess Spencey B is kind of the more enlightened uh, version of Trent Steele, maybe. So, <laughs> yeah, more like, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I was going to ask you, what are some of the craziest things you've got into in terms of coaching? I mean, not necessarily, I don't need to know about your uh, personal life necessarily, but like sure. in terms of co coaching crazy stuff. Now you got to remember I'm here in California. So Right. You know, almost nothing's going to surprise me. But um, so you had sure. mentioned polyamorous relationships and like. Yeah. So, you know, so I was in a relationship for uh, for a couple of years with a girl that really, you know, she was managing my career and, and stuff. And I really wanted to start um, exploring triad relationships. The, the what's interesting is like, you know, if there's two people in a relationship and, you know, I've got 10 attributes that I have and she's got 10 attributes that she has. 
between the two of us, there's a hundred variables. That makes sense. 10 times yeah. 10. 10 times you 10. have a third person in there. It's not 200. It's a thousand. Right. 10 and times so 10 times it, 10. it becomes very difficult to, to manage. So I was fascinated by not just the sexual relationship of polyamorous of polyamory, but also of the, of the interpersonal and romantic dynamics of it as well. Uh, so for, um, so for the past, I mean, for, you know, so for like five years, I basically explored polyamorous relationships with, uh, you know, multiple different women. Uh, the, the craziest thing that I did get into was, uh, um, is don't, with say one an, of my, don't, don't say animals. Uh, I mean, that might be a little too far. We were certainly acting like animals, but, uh, yeah. but no actual an, animals for sure. Okay. Um, uh, on, on Halloween, I believe it was two years ago or three years ago, uh, on Halloween, one of my clients that I, that I had helped, like, you know, he was, a he was a guy from like the back hills of Canada. You know, he was a little bit overweight. He was in his mid forties and he wanted to like know what it was like to be like the coolest guy in the city. So like, uh, he did my, he did kind of my, what's called my dream package that yeah. is, uh, you know, that is for the high end clients. And basically we bought him a condo in, in uh, downtown Chicago. I hired my, my designer to design it perfectly. It was logistically perfect for women. It was in the, it was in a great location. And this guy wanted to know what it was like to date, you know, 20 something year old girls. And, wow. uh, and so he got, I mean, he had just one story after the next of just like, you know, different hot young girl after yeah, hot young girl, all while being completely honest and authentic and open that he had kids and divorce and all that. And there was, uh, there was one time, you know, uh, I had kind of taken a break from being a little bit wild. And he's like, he's like, Spency, I want to see the lion this oh, weekend no. for Halloween. Wait, so, he's, like, so, he, so you got him into that and he actually took it and ran with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and a lot with, with those high-end clients. Like, I spent a lot of time with them. Uh, I mean, some of my clients, you know, I, I take off and I stay with them for a week to, you know, to show them how to live this way, you know. Uh, in a way that's like completely, you know, authentic and real and honest and transparent, but still can be as edgy and fun as you want it to be. That's the perfect marriage, you know, um, cause a lot of guys want to live on the edge, but they still want to be good guys. And that's totally possible. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that weekend, that weekend, I, I watched, I watched him pick up two different girls uh, over the, over the weekend. And then me and the girl I was seeing at, at the time, I, I, we, I told him, I said, we're going to pull a foursome. And so I, I basically would, you know, date girls and teach girls how to pick up girls, uh, you know, you know, for us. Okay. So then I don't really have to do any of the work. Right. Um, it's, it's essentially scaling your dating life. Um, and awesome. we, we went as Betty Rubble and Fred Flintstone, the original mm -hmm. affair. <laughs> so, and we were going around looking for our Wilma. Right. And, um, I mean, I don't know how, how much, how many, how much details that you want, but we, we met these girls in, uh, in line at a, at a club uh, okay. downtown. And before we could finish our first drink, uh, we had, uh, we, we had the girls in the cabs back to the place and, uh, you know, uh, you know, had our fun there. That's amazing. So, so you actually trained the girls to figure out how to, how, that angle basically. How yeah. To, that's amazing. <laughs> but, because like a woman, a woman like sees a man's ability to like hunt and there's something sexy about it where it's like he owns the room. And then it's so basically it's like, how would you like to have that power? And because most girls are the ones who are receiving, you know, the, right. the, the hunting. And so girls like that are like, like, oh man, I, yeah, I, I want to know what that's like. And so that's, that's the draw, you know? Now, is that though for women to uh, meet other women? It's not for women to meet men, is it? Right. It's for women to meet other women. Yeah. Right. Because I could see where they would need to be aggressive hunters for women, but for men, the dynamic is already kind of there. It's already set. Right. Right. Yeah. If, you're, if you're attractive and relatively outgoing, it's not really hard. Right. Now, I did, I did see though that you did um, have something where you were teaching women about sex with men, right? Yeah. So that is yeah. reverse on the angle. So I guess the angle, well, you tell me, but I, the way I saw it is since you're a man, you know what the men's side of things are, right. you're coaching them on how to be better with men. How did that happen? Right. So uh, it's interesting. This was earlier on in, in my uh, dating coaching career. So it was probably about 2010. 
And um, this was before, this was before, um, actually it was before 2010, maybe 2009. Um, and, you know, this was before, you know, coaching was really like a, like a thing. Like nowadays, you know, coaching and mentoring is, is a normal thing. Back then it really wasn't. And so I was trying to, you know, teach guys, uh, you know, foreplay and sex. That's, that's originally where I started is just teaching sex. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, so I held an event for, uh, you know, teaching, teaching guys and girls uh, seduction of, or uh, uh, sex and foreplay. And so much, so many more women showed up than men. So I did mm-hmm. another one and like 15 guys showed, but like 60 women showed. And so finally <laughs> I was like, you know what? I'm just going to teach women. So we used to run these events uh, like, like high end bachelorette parties. Like they, they would show up. So the guys that I was co- were coaching were like the concierge. When you showed up, you received the flower. And you were escorted up to this, up, is, like, up this, to, uh, this is like bringing the fox into the hen house. <laughs> oh, dude, <it's, laughs> I mean, I love it. Keep would, talking. I'm sorry, I just they, had would, to, they would get a make, flower. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I'm just saying this is amazing. I mean, just, <laughs> if I had thought about this when I was in my 20s, we keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they would re- receive a flower and then be escorted up to like the reception room where there were high top tables. Um, I'm sponsored by Grey Goose. So I, I had, I, I believe that I had 30 bottles of Grey Goose for 100 women. So, or I know it's 36 bottles. I, I had six cases. So 36 bottles of Grey Goose for 100 women. Oh. And uh, I had uh, a mixologist come in and make custom cocktails. I had an acoustic artist, you know, uh, playing in the corner. I had a number of sponsors. So I had like chocolate served and all that. And I taught the guys how to socialize the room, how to introduce girls into to new girls and stuff. And then we set up, uh, we set up the, the room like a, like, a, like a wedding reception. So like round table, flower centerpieces. And I gave an hour to an hour and a half long talk essentially on how to please your man like it's not enough just to make your to to get your man off like that's that's not difficult as a woman i mean sometimes right. you just want to look at it right and, right. and yeah, you're good exactly. to go but like how do you engage with a man sexually so not only is he is he pleasured but that he he's almost like loyal to you because of it like right. it's not hard to get a man as a woman but to keep one and to keep one loyal to different story. So I, um, you know, the whole, the whole concept that I, you know, my whole, the whole sexual concept came from, uh, you know, uh, a, a dream that I had when I was 13. (laughs) And so, and this is what actually started my sex career. So I had this dream that I was in the elevator with, uh, Denise Richards. That might, that might date me a little bit. Um, and I had never had sex before. I mean, I lost my virginity when I was 18 or 19. Um, and, and I had sex with her in the elevator. And I woke up and I, I realized I came to bed. Like I just, I came everywhere. Oh, and I was like, wait a minute, hold on one second. I totally had a full blown ejaculation, but no one touched me. And it was at that point I realized sex is in the brain, mm-hmm. not in the genitals. Right. The genitals are just a vehicle for the brain to do its thing. And I was like, so wait a minute, if you want to be good at sex, you need to understand the brain. And since I already had the, you know, the, the, all the NLP experience of how to reverse engineer physical feeling into, uh, you know, emotional and in, in images, you know, it, it, it just made sense to me. And at yeah. that point, um, at, at that point, you know, for about two years, that's all I did was teach women, you know, how to, how to have sex. <laughs> awesome. in, in fact, there, that's there were some cool. private clients, private clients, there are women that I've taught how to have orgasms without even touching them. Really? All happens in the brain, yeah. Now, wait a minute. Now, I've seen something like this um, called uh, tantric, uh, tantric something, but mm-hmm. it looks fake. Like you see someone like just kind of waving their hands, like they're waving energy across and the mm-hmm. girl's having an organ. That seems right. fake to me. Well, l- let me, let me give you a little. About? Yeah. So let, let me give you, let me give you uh, an example here, okay? So yeah. I, I want you to imagine this lemon, okay? You've got this, this lemon in your hand. Now, with, with the lemon, I want you to take a knife and I want you to slice that lemon you know, it, it, uh, in your hand so the juices are falling all, all over your hand. And then I want you to pick up that lemon and squeeze it as tight as you can and so all the juices are, are falling into your mouth and the tartness covers the, you know, the tip of your tongue. Let me ask you this. Is your mouth kind of salivating a little bit? 
Yeah, no, because I, I was visualizing it and I and I kind of know what that's like to lemon in exactly. my mouth. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So not, not to be a pervert or anything, but your mouth salivating is no different than a pussy getting wet. It's an autonomic response to a physiological uh, um, thing. Now, granted, if I did have a lemon, your mouth would water. But if I talk about a lemon, your, your mouth watered just the same. Right. So an orgasm is a more extreme version of that. It's an autonomic response to something that's physical. But if I can draw those pictures in your mind and get you to feel them, then mm-hmm. I can put you on that. Uh, and then I, I, can, I can put a woman on an orgasmic spectrum. Because again, an orgasm isn't just a climax. A climax is a part of the orgasm. The, the, the orgasm starts with arousal. And so from, from arousal becomes a little bit more excitement. You know, from excitement, the heart starts to beat a little bit faster. The skin starts to become a little more flush. And so mm-hmm. um, if, uh, if, if a woman can have an orgasm through masturbating, I can take her through, through, uh, through that in, in, a, in a way that, uh, that connects her to that orgasm mentally and emotionally. And then from there, I can, I can help her wire it to like the sexual interaction she's having with a man or something like that. So that's... So are, so are you... Topic. Are you talking to make that connection? Are you talking to them, telling them what to do, or mm-hmm. so you're you're talking? Yep, yep. Words. All all language, because language has the ability to create images. Images have the ability to create emotion, and emotion has the the ability to create a um, an autonomic uh, visceral response. Okay, so when you're talking, you're 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 describing images. And, and getting them to visualize things. You're not just saying words and all the stuff's happening. You're, 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 you have to talk to get the idea into them. But what you're really doing is planting visualizations into their head. That brings right. Us a, okay. Right. And, well, and then as, as those visualizations are, are coming up and they're starting to, to feel the light nuances of the orgasm, I'm calling attention to that. So it's, it's recognized. That once you're aware, now you can be mindful. Once you can be mindful, then you can start transmuting that energy into whatever you want. Wow. Is, so is this, um, did you figure that out on your own? I mean, um, yeah. like you put those two together and you actually tried it and it actually worked? Yeah. That must have been wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it, it, what's funny is it, it also work, works for erectile dysfunction. So I've worked with a lot of guys that, um, that, you know, they get nervous and they, you know, they can't get an erection or they get an erection and they ejaculate too quickly. Or the worst out of all of them is you can get an erection and you can have sex, but you can't come. Oh. And that one actually is like hurts a woman's emotions the most because it's oh, like really? making guys come is easy. Like if he's not coming, what do you not find me attractive? That's what they're thinking. All right. And, all right. um, and I, I've yet to come across a guy that I cannot help um, with any one of those three, uh, any one of those three challenges. Because it, it, again, it sex is all in the head. So that seems like that would be kind of awkward, though. What do you have a guy like sitting on a couch or something, and you're talking to him? And is I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm not awkward. talking to him straight about his dick. I'm not talking dirty to him. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> whispering that in his was, ear I mean, i'm trying to figure out. yeah i don't really want to know too much detail but i'm curious like i could i could picture you doing it to a woman but then having a guy there is kind of you know sure. <laughs> okay. and, and you know they, he's he's got to be open to the idea of talking about like hey I'm, I'm having sex i'm having sex with this girl and um and you know it's not happening so so for instance like one of the uh one of the the things if uh you know if a, if a guy can't orgasm one of the suggestions I, I give him is, you know, have a conversation with your, with your girl and say, we're going to have sex. And the only rule is we both can't have orgasms. So we're going to do this just to play. So the first step is remove the expectation, have a session where you don't have an orgasm, but that's what you planned on doing. Okay. So there's no you pressure know? at that point. He's not pressured to perform, so to speak. Exactly. And if, um, you know, and if, if he's about to orgasm, uh, I tell him like, if so, even if it works the first time you try it, do not because the, the being good sexually as a man, isn't about being able to last forever or, you know, or being able, it's about having command over your orgasm. Mm -hmm. So if if you want to be good, right. Sting says he can have sex for six hours on, on command. (laughs) 
<laughs> exactly. You should be able to have sex for six hours, or if you're having sex in the unisex bathroom of a movie theater, that was, that was my last good one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, is there a story there? <laughs> <laughs> there? There is a story in a short video. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, but you also should be able to, to ejaculate within 30 seconds, having full command over your orgasm, oh. because if, if you want to be good with women, it's, uh, there, there are, there is, is one you know, major concept in that it is this, that your dick works for you and not the other way around. So it's like, I could turn down, I can t- turn down an entire busload of Hawaiian tropics models. If, uh, you know, if, if it came down to it, I can choose to not have sex with them. You know, I can, I can choose to have sex in ejaculate in 30 seconds, or I can fuck for, you know, eight hours if I want to having command over your dick. So it becomes the soldier and not the general. That's the secret to being, you know, to having, you know, that kind of masculine, you know, sexual power. And that, and that seems like an offshoot uh, generally of the um, confidence being of command of yourself and not succumbing to like, Oh, I like her so much. And then you, everything, you know, you're subservient all of a sudden, right? Cause the okay. second they sense that it's all over. Right. Exactly. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, those are the stuff you've talked about here are, would be entire uh, courses. I don't know if you've made courses and all this stuff, but that's, uh, you know, I can yeah, imagine so, huge business there <laughs> for all of us. Oh yeah. Things. You know, all of these courses are in my Omega Man program. So, oh, so like, so these are all encapsulated. Yeah. So, okay. you know, I've, I've done a number of programs before, uh, you know, I've done certain events like, you know, my, my uh, seduction and foreplay or my foreplay and sex events. You know, I've done, you know, one-on-one private coaching and this Omega man, uh, uh, this Omega man program is really kind of, uh, is kind of a culmination of everything that I've put together over the past decade of being a, of being a dating coach and put it into, into one place, you know, for guys to use as a, as a resource. So we go through everything from how to pick up a girl simply using eye contact through how to give her a, a squirting orgasm, how to, you know, how to play her body like a musical instrument, you know, how to physically escalate everything from a handshake to, you know, have her on the couch at, you know, at your house. So, uh, yeah, so we go over, you know, every single one of these uh, tips and tricks, techniques and, you know, meta views are in, are in the program. Okay. That's pretty powerful. Uh, so one thing, um, when I had first contacted you, I, I told you, I'm looking at this piece of paper here. Look, I actually, it's seven qualities of a man. Makes one, I'm serious. I put it because it struck me as stuff that any man should have period. Not, not even having to do about having a woman attracted to you, but mm-hmm. just being a man. Um, I'm not going to yeah. go through these ad nauseum, but just real quick, like social Chameleons, the first one, being able to navigate in any situation, yeah. you need that as a, as a man, regardless. Right. Immovable master plan, you've got a plan, you're going for it. That's, mm-hmm. you know, maybe that gets into your visualization thing. Um, yeah. That's something you need, right? Otherwise, you're just yeah. uh, wandering aimlessly. Fail yeah. gracefully. You know, how do you, uh, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. You know, I was going to say to that the the master plan one. You know, one of the one of the big mindset shifts that guys need to make is you need to have something in your life that's more important than your relationship with her. Yeah. And and what marriage is 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 is, is a switch. Okay, you are now my number one priority, uh, and and women have to earn that. But your 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 mission in life has to be number one. Well, so on that little tangent there in the switch. Um, so women want that they want to be the priority and, and, you know, when you're married, it, 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 the priorities switch around, but then again, that's also still seems like that would be unattractive <laughs> at some point, right. right? Because they don't, they want to chase after something, even though you're married, they got it. They still, it's those wanting two opposite things at the same time. Right. So if you're, it, yeah, honey, you know, the honey do this. Yeah, honey. Yeah, honey. Yeah, honey. Right. You kind of lose your mojo. Absolutely. And, and here's the thing is like, once you get the girl, we go, we fall into partner mode and we fall out of dating mode. Like you need to hunt your girl as if you've never slept with her before, even though you have like full privilege to, to all of her fun parts, you need to chase her like you don't. And that's what, that's what keeps a relationship, uh, that, that spark alive. Mm, okay. Now, 
<clears throat> so, you know, now that we're talking about this, I'm going to say something really personal here. Um, I have noticed, uh, cause I used to have a lot of stuff going on. I was moving forward in movable plan and, you know, women are chasing after you. Right. But after you're mm -hmm. married, you lose that part of you, but I, I got a lot of energy from, from that, like that mm -hmm. carried over into other, other things. So okay. I am working on getting my energy back, but I'm not, you know, I can't just go out and go dating. Right. Right. So, um, so it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird area. I'm sure a lot of men are, are in there kind of, you need that mojo, but um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know if you yeah. have any thoughts on that or if you well, don't want to talk well, are you talking about getting the, the energy back um, from having a yeah before, having before being married? Focus? Before being married, you know, you've got the stuff going and the and the dating the mm. and all that stuff. It kind of gives you it gives you energy, right? Right. Just interaction with the women and and I don't know. There's just an energy there um, yeah. that you get well, after you're married. That that's you're not doing that stuff anymore. Ah, uh, I see. Are you married now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, uh, my advice for that is, is have something that you're doing that is, that's outside of your relationship. And I don't mean another girl. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, uh, like something that you're passionate about. So it's like, whether it's, whether it's a, uh, a new hobby, a new skill, a new, um, you know, uh, you know, getting in shape. Uh, or, or something that you just take severe interest in, you need, you need to, to, when you separate, uh, from, you know, your wife during the day, there needs to be, you need to come back a different person. If you're coming back as the same exact person that she, that she knew as soon as you left, and that's the cycle of your life, then, then she's going to disregard you because the human brain is, is, is taking in 2 billion bits of information per second or something stupid like that. And so what it does is it, it, it deletes the things of which it already knows and it fixates its stuff on the things that it's trying to figure out. And so if you become something of which she already knows, her brain can't help but disregard you. So yeah. when you come to, when you come, you know, to, to the dinner table or you come to bed, you know, with, with a, a slightly different version of you, that's, what's going to keep that spark alive. Yeah. And actually i I have been going out and I do a whole bunch of different stuff. I've been doing martial arts for about three years awesome. and I've got my, my Ducati and, you know, motorcycle riding. I've, so I, I have a bunch of stuff that I'm, I'm doing, but I've uh, more recently really, I'm going to really go out and, and, really get that energy back and i used to be a uh, uh, singer in a band as i told you and i have an album on itunes so i'm going to get back into a lot of the stuff i was doing before so yeah. um so yeah you're you're right i just uh, that's those activities and those things the energy builds up you know you, you get yeah. the the passion and excitement again so anyway yeah. we're i don't know how we got on there we were on a movable a movable master plan yeah, and somehow yeah, like, i I spilled my uh, personal beans. <laughs> uh, so that's cool. I, pre I appreciate your tips though. And I, yeah. hopefully somebody listening that might spark something, um, yeah. you know, in, in their mind too. Um, so real quick, I, you know, I'm not going to go super detailed, but fail gracefully. All of us, you know, you, you try things, it doesn't work. You know, are you able to bounce back? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Patient listener, uh, I guess that gets into listening what people say and, and responding back and forth. Um, absolute certainty, which is kind of like how your omega is to the alpha male. Absolute certainty is, is to confidence. It's above confidence. Like, right. You're just certain decisiveness and trustworthiness. So I found these things to be very valuable for anybody. Is your uh, omega man package, even though it's focused on dating, would you say it, it also serves a larger purpose in, in uh, a man's confidence level overall that it can fit into other parts of their life? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, this, this Omega man program really is a, um, it's a, it's a self-improvement and transformative, uh, program that gets you playing at the highest level as a man, because that is what's attractive to women. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, the, the way, the way that it's pitched on our website is like, Hey, do you know, do you want to be dating higher quality girls? Cause that, that's what appeals to, that's what appeals to our primal mind. Like, Hey, sure. you want to get that girl? Yeah, but if you walk up to someone and it's like, "Hey, would you like to go through a transformative process so you can get <laughs> right. don't give a shit about that." 
Right, okay? right. Yeah. But but ultimately, you know, when you become when you embody those qualities and you become decisive and you have an immovable plan and you learn how to be empathetic and, and, a, and a good listener and you embody the uh, the the concept of invincibility, which is uh, failing gracefully, you either win by getting what you want or you win more by learning a lesson. And then the next 10 times you come across that, you win 10 times over. Got right. It. Uh, you know, that, that's, that, that's the whole concept. And when you become confident in your ability to speak to women, talking in a board meeting is not that difficult, you know, networking to, to, um, to, you know, improve your, your business or, you know, or whatever your, it is that you're, you're chasing life becomes, you know, becomes, uh, becomes easier. Like there's nothing that inspires a man more to be the best version of himself than being with a high quality woman. And so in this program, you know, you know, I understand that I understand that the quality of your romantic relationships is the number one indicator of your overall happiness, you know, other than like physical health, like if you have cancer, right. you know, um, and, and so, you know, once you have that, once you have that going, it seems like most other things fall into place because most things need to be in place in order for that to get going. In order to get, yeah. So it's, it's, it's like, a, it's a marker that you have a lot of those things in place basically if, or you wouldn't have that woman yep so to speak put in place okay that's really cool um yeah this is this is awesome stuff let me ask you a question on in terms of your own personal habits like i've got things that i uh try to do every day you know check it off my list like when i get up in the morning do you have any yeah. you had mentioned journaling i think um yeah is that right what do you what's your routine in the morning to kind of get your mind right or you just wake up with your mind right i uh, know so you know before you go to bed it's really important for you to uh for you to take a look at your day and and visualize what it is that you want to accomplish and and review what it is that your that you know this phase of your life is 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 bringing you know um and so that that's number one so go to bed knowing what your day looks like the next day um, and then in the morning, uh, you, I do what's called a five and five meditation. I spend five mm-hmm. minutes in silence and five minutes of uninterrupted writing about what it is, you know, what it is that I, that I see for my day. And what this does is this creates little episodes in your head of okay. like, maybe, maybe the journaling is, you know, is it's five minutes of me, what my day looks like today. Maybe it's like what my life is going to look like in a year once I accomplish my goals. You know, maybe it's going to be, you know, maybe I'll, I'll do a little episode of, you know, what uh, doing a podcast with you is, is going to look like. And when you draw a, when you draw a vivid image in your head, it creates familiarity and we always gravitate towards familiarity uh, in, in every situation that we, we go to what's familiar and the brain cannot tell the difference between something that is, or pardon me, it stores a memory that really happened and a memory that you created in your imagination in the exact same way. Same way. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let me, let me, right there, let me, so I, um, cause this is maybe something that will help me and maybe help others. So I've been writing in my little journal, like a little gratitude and just what mm-hmm. I'm going to do today. But I, I, I'm not, re- I'm just kind of going through the motions, frankly, just to yeah. do it, hoping something will happen. But the connection that I'm making now after talking to you is that it's not just writing it down. It's actually the powerful part is actually visualizing the, the I, yeah, I'm writing it down mechanically, but the important part is visualizing the little pieces. So I actually picture the next day, picture yeah. the things happening. That seems to be more important than, than the writing part. And I haven't been doing the visualization part. Mm-hmm. I was just writing down, you know, bullet points and, and frankly, I never read them, go back and read them and I forget about it. Right. Is that, am I getting something right there or? Yeah. You're, you're and you're close because there's one more part to it. So okay. writing, writing um, is, is different than typing because writing is the first step to manifestation. It's taking it, a, a thought and turning it into a physical thing, ink on paper. So that's oh, I've important. been typing. I've been typing it with mm. my phone. Uh, you know, I, 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 I debate between the two men and I... You know, I type a lot of uh, stuff like notes throughout the day and stuff like that. But when it comes to like introspection, I uh, pen on paper. That is, uh, that's the way that I, that's the way that I do it. Yeah. Um, so that's step one. Step two is the visualizations. Okay. So like, what, what does this, what does this look like? That's what okay, I then mean. step three, 
is the secret sauce. Okay. Is stepping into the feeling of it. Ooh, okay? okay. So yeah. it's like, okay, what will what will um what will it feel like once I'm done, you know, having this this uh this conversation in in this podcast? You know, how am I gonna feel afterwards? What am I what am I gonna do afterwards? Well, I, I've already visualized in my head how I'm gonna feel. I'm gonna go out for uh and I'm gonna grab get uh grab a run, grab a run, go for a run. And basically just kind of celebrate my day. This is the last appointment that I have for the day, mine and your conversation. And so I'm going to, so like when I visualize, my, visualize myself today, I visualize myself, you know, finishing an awesome conversation with you, which so far I feel like it's going pretty yeah. good. And, and then celebrating by celebrating by, you know, getting some exercise and, and honoring my body and, uh, and being, and having gratitude that like my legs work for crying out loud. Like yeah. that's, you know, so I, I actually take myself in that place where I'm actually breathing heavy. I'm sweating. I'm listening to my headphones. I'm 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 forecasting myself, reflecting on my day and and being right. like, wow, you know, I had a great bre- I had a great brunch meeting uh, this morning. I had a really awesome connection call. Uh, you know, I I really engaged with my students. And so stepping into that feeling of once you get those things accomplished, that's the secret sauce. Wow. And you know what? I've been missing those last two. I've just mm-hmm. been typing a couple of stuff so I could check off on my list. And it really hasn't done anything for me, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is pretty amazing. I, I'm you know, starting tomorrow morning or tonight. I'll visualize the next day. I'm going to try adding these two here and internalizing it visually yeah. and emotion-wise. And um, give it, you know, give, I'm going to give it a try. That's, that's great. If you well, don't mind me asking, yeah. what what is what's one of your what's one of your goals that that you write write down? Um, you know what? That's funny because I've been writing down more uh, tactical things. Like um, I'm going to contact five people every day to be on the podcast or what have you. So I guess I could I could visualize me contacting the person, and you know, I guess I could use it for that as well. It's not like a earth shattering goal for that. It's, it's the kind of small things to do every day. Well, uh, so l- let me ask you this. You, if you contact five people mm-hmm. every day for the next 30 days, what's that going to do for your podcast? You know, so, so actually my first stage goal is to get to my first hundred because mm-hmm. I'll be uh, making connections and, you know, I'm doing it in, a little bit in karate and making various connections in various niches so to me, that will grow the podcast and its its breadth and depth, and get more followers. So okay. uh, if I contacted 150 people in one month, I've ha- I have a pretty high ratio, uh, which I've learned in sales of contacting people. I have a pretty high ratio of connecting. Um, so I mean, that could blow me up a lot faster. That's like a 10x. It's a 10x right. Grant Cardone 10x type thing. Yeah. And so it like, so once you get this, this 10 X thing now, so now you've contacted 150 people and you know, uh, what's a number where you would consider your podcast to be blown up? Like what, what's the number of subscribers? Uh, well, you, know, you would be excited about no, like really excited about. Yeah. I mean, initially I, and I should 10, I should, I should think big, you know, Tim Ferriss has got, uh, I don't know how many millions of downloads, but I mean, if I could get into tens of thousands and, and see okay. that, I think that's a, a base I could, I could really build off of. To me, that means this thing's going to go. Nice. You know, it's gonna be something. And, my, and my goal with it is to um, reach a lot of people, to help people. I also you know, would like to um, have it be one of my main things that I, that I eventually make a living off of various things, right. monetizing it, meeting people, sure. business. I'm also doing this personally because um, I'm going through a change. I, I left the industry that I was in. And uh, try to make a change, and I also need to get out and network and meet more people, such as yourself. You know, I love talking to people like this, and uh, so I, I've got a lot of things rolled into this um, that that I'm really enjoying. Uh, okay. So that's that's there's some meaning to this, other than I'm not just doing a podcast just for no reason. Awesome. So now, now I want you to imagine that that you've um, that you've been reaching out to five people every single day. For the, for the next 60 days, 
Okay. okay. So now it's 300 people. Yeah. And what this has done is this has gotten you 50,000 followers on your podcast. Mm. Now at now you've got these 50,000 followers, you're starting to monetize it. And now whatever that you're, you're monetizing, it's actually bringing you in enough money for this to be your sole gig. Okay. Now I want you to, I want you to imagine like all that money coming in, the money in the bank. And now it's, it's another morning and you're writing in that, and you're writing in that notebook, I'm going to contact five people. And the five people you're going to contact now are Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, and I, and all those guys. I see the look on your face right now. Yeah, of, of yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, so now you, this, the beauty is that you're, you're putting into much more focus and visualization what I'm thinking, but I'm, I'm so vague right. right now. Right. And so now when you are writing those, those things down in the morning, I am going to contact five people today. You just, you now what I want you to do is, is in your imagery, I want you to, to put yourself two months from now. You've got 50,000 followers and you, you've got all that money coming in and, the, and, and you're writing down the same thing, except for those five people that you're calling today are Joe Rogan, Tim Ferriss. And I mean, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. <laughs> and so, and so here's the thing, what makes a, what, what makes, uh, a, a, what makes a, a memory stick in the brain is, is two, uh, two factors. One is the, is the intensity of the emotion that's felt. And okay. two is the, two is the repetition of it. Okay. Those two things create that create the, the intensity and the vividness of that image that allows you, allows, you know, your manifestation mechanism to pull you forward towards that. And so the reason that physical experiences uh, stick so hard is because it's easy to feel impact and emotion when you're using all five of your senses. Right. But if you, if you use repetition and strong imagery, like that scene in your head is going to become very familiar. And remember what the brain does, it seeks familiarity. And so and all throughout I, your day. I've been, I've been missing this. Yeah. I've been, yeah. I, I've been missing the uh, connecting the visual and the emotion and all that. I completely, it's been very clinical. I write it down, but I'm not really feeling anything. And I know it, yeah. I know something's missing. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, this is pretty amazing. I mean, I, I, I can't believe, you know, it makes so much sense. I can't believe I haven't run across this. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, to be <laughs> honest with you, man, I, 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 I don't know. Like, like I said, I, um, I, uh, it, in terms of like mentors in this area, I, I don't really have any. Uh, like I said, I'm not really certified. Um, I have a, uh, as kind of boo-boo as this sounds, I have a very direct connection with source energy that, um, that has given me a, a you know, a, a gift to kind of like be able to see into people's minds and kind of tinker with it using, you know, language and imagery. So, yeah. uh, I, I'm, hopefully this, this helps you in your day to day. This is fantastic. And I, I think uh, so a lot of listeners too, when they hear this, will I, I, I bet a lot of people are like me too. Like they've been kind of going yeah. through some motions, but something's not quite, you know, clicking. Um, right. so, so yeah. I'm going to put this into practice, you know, thank you so awesome. much for, for sharing that and, you know, making that connection. It's, it's great. No <laughs> so, um, usually to uh, kind of at the end of the conversation, um, and I'm hoping, I'm thinking we might have some more conversations moving forward, but, yeah. um, I, I ask what would be, uh, the, your concept of the, what the manceptional man would be. I have a feeling it's the Omega man. <laughs> <laughs> right. But maybe just for our listeners, you know, uh, Manceptional is about getting on, following your passion, go on your own path, uh, co- you know, just carving your own path in life, um, acquiring all these man skills, being a better, a better version of yourself, as you said. Um, you know, can you maybe encapsulate that? It's, I suppose it's the Omega Man. Is there some way yeah. you can encapsulate that, what that person would look like and so we could visualize what we just learned today? Yeah visualize what that looks like and then become it. Yeah. So there's, there's three main components to being, uh, to being, you know, the, the type of man that you want to be. And this is universal for every man. Okay. Uh, step one is awareness. Like know who you are. I can't remember who said it, but know thyself is like the, it's like if you're given one piece of advice for this life, it is know thyself. So spend your time in, in uh, you know, journaling, meditating. I mean, I have over 45 continuous days of video journals. Like oh, video uh, journal. Is that just for yourself? Yeah, just for me, man. 
and, and, and that's, you know, that's how I'm, that's how I'm good at, you know, at public speaking, you know, how much, you know, camera time I have, you know, experience, uh, because I'm, I'm very self-aware. So awareness is step one. Mindfulness is step two, which is basically awareness in motion. So, you know, being mindful of what you're doing every day, you know, what, you know, where, where are you, where are you spending your attention? You know, your attention is the most, is at the end of the day, your attention is the only thing that you own. Everything else is just rented. Okay. And your attention is so valuable. I want you to think about this. Your attention is so valuable that giant companies pay millions and millions of dollars just to get 10 seconds of it. That's how valuable your attention is. That's a good point. Be, be mindful of your, of your, uh, your thoughts, your words, your actions. And then finally is to, is to sensitize yourself to your integrity. Now by integrity, the, my definition of integrity is when your, uh, your, your thoughts, your words, and your actions are all the same thing. And when you, uh, when you are attuned to your integrity, then that is, that, that is basically the, the concept of perfection is when your intentions, your words, and your actions, or your thoughts, your words, your actions are all the same thing. Here's the thing, you know, uh, my, my intention might be to break your car window. My, I'm going to tell you I'm going to break your car window and then I'm going to break it. In that moment, I'm perfect. I'm an asshole, <laughs> right. but I am perfect. I, I'm right. in line with myself. Right. So, so, so then it comes full circle. Be aware of who you are, what you want. Be mindful of the way that you're executing and then measure your integrity. Are your, are your intentions, your words, and your actions all the same thing? Wow. If you do that, you will be the man that you set out to be. Wow, that's awesome. I, mean, I don't have anything to add to that. So <laughs> um, this was a great session. I, I, I feel like we could probably talk for several more hours, but we'll keep it at uh, an hour and a half or so here uh, so people can listen to it uh, nicely. But um, how can people look up uh, your, your program uh, or contact you or follow you? What are the best ways for, uh, for listeners to do that? So the best way to follow me is on Instagram. Get a little taste of my of my personal life on there, and it's simply just Spencer Burnett, S P E N C E R B U R N E T T, one word. And to, to uh, take a look at the Omega Man program, uh, I've partnered with a uh, with a Trip Kramer from Trip Advice. And so you can go to tripadvice.com slash coaching. And basically it, uh, there is an entire, you know, a single, a single page that explains everything about the Omega man, a coaching program. And if we are accepting applications, there will be a button on there for you to, uh, to fill out an application to be a part of it or to, to see if you qualify to be a part of it. And then I offer for those people that we accept the applications, you actually get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, strategy session for me uh, that's free. So uh, we can talk about uh, what it is that's holding you back and help give you some guidance on how you can get from where you're at to where you want to be. And, uh, and I'll give you options of how we can uh, you know, work together so I can help you make that a reality. That's awesome. Uh, so Spencer, thanks. W one thing I got to say, I, I, I want to see you on a Ted talk. You got to work that out wow. because uh, you know, if you can, if you, I, I think, first of all, people be very interested in it. Um, this is talking about your, you know, the way you're going to change the world with the, yeah. all the, uh, it's not NLP, precise it's precise language, precise language, precise language, precise language right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so make that happen, man. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that is, that, that is definitely going to be on the list. Yeah. So let's, um, let's definitely keep in touch. Uh, of course, if you're ever in, in LA, let me know. And uh, let's keep in touch moving forward. I, I uh, enjoyed uh, our conversation today. Absolutely, man. Anytime that, uh, that you want me on the show, I'm always down for some, some good, interesting conversation to help out guys. Awesome. Awesome. All right, Spencer, thank you so much. All right, man. Okay, take care. Thank you.